and welcome to the Daily Space Weather! I'm your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash on Mash, coming at you from the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. As we, once again, bring you the most detailed imagery of the closest star and the most comprehensive space weather you'll find in the known universe. Yeah, we've got to do a cosmology segment, perhaps later today. There's a possible panel discussion coming. We had a nearly X-class flare up here in the northwestern limb. That is the most active sunspot, the most likely place to see additional large flares. And at least one new sunspot having risen in the northeast. So this sunspot here has already got a name. This one down here not named yet. That will get a name today as it is quite substantial. It will be a separate group from the area to its north. So here's the region that produced that large flare. It was in the upper M the upper M class level. Let's look even closer here. That's a 24 hour view in 131 plus 171 angstroms. Two species of ionized iron followed by the SDO. And that, my friends, is a good telescope. Quick reminder, folks, that our finest days lie ahead. So uh, thanks for tuning in to the Daily Space Weather content. We enjoy enjoying it with you, the viewer. Here's yesterday plus today, the SDO intensity gram. That sunspot up there is quite large. And the closer it gets to the limb, the more likely it is to produce an X-class solar flare. Does that tell us something about heliophysics? Well, perhaps it does. We won't get into it in this episode. We don't want it to be too long. After all, it is the daily space weather. Here's your SDO magnetogram also. And that sunspot's looking pretty magnetically simple at the moment. Not as simple as some of the channels that are attempting to cover space weather. All right, so let's take a look at volcanoes real quick here. We've got Stromboli continuing to erupt. Some effusive activity and some lava fountaining happening there at Stromboli, as evidenced in the photograph. Volcanic tremor started to fluctuate between medium and high values after 1700 local time yesterday, but decreased to average medium to low values. Shivaluch continues to explode and produce a 13,000 foot plume of volcanic ash. That's a flight level 130 over Kamchatka. Not sure if Suwanose Jima is erupting. Please do not pole vault the caldera. That's the hard way to find out. The volcanic ash is not identifiable in the satellite imagery. Fuego in Guatemala exploding, flight level 160. It's a 16,000 foot ash plume. And here is the Machine volcano in Colombia. So that's showed some thermal anomalies there. Um, temperature pulsating there around between 70 and 95 degrees Celsius. The volcano alert level remains at yellow despite that being a sign for a possible uptick at Machin. Nevado del Ruiz exploding in Colombia. That's a flight level 200, 20,000-foot ash plume. 22,000-foot ash plume over Cotopaxi at Ecuador. Flight level 220, flight level 230 over Sabancaya in Peru. Let's take a look at seismicity. There was one large earthquake in the past 24 hours. It came in just a few hours ago. There's the past 90 days in a convenient bar graph form, and thanks for leaving a comment, Mike. So there's the largest quake of the past 24 hours. That was a 6.5 magnitude at extreme depth in the Bismarck Sea there. Off the coast of one of the isles of Papua New Guinea. And that was nearly at 600 kilometers estimated depth. That would have been like an 8 magnitude quake had that happened at the surface. That would have been bad news. Could have produced a tsunami at that magnitude at the surface. Anyway, let's run up the list here, citing anything over a 5. So let's see. We have some to report here, like this 5.1 at Laikit, Indonesia. So more activity there north of Australia. Also, China had a 
Those two quakes were only about four minutes apart from each other, exactly four minutes apart from each other to the second, it looks like. So a 5.1 there at Indonesia, and then very shortly after a 5.2 at China. Continuing on the list here, let us know if we've missed anything in the comments section. There's another 5.3 in Central America there at Guatemala. That one came in at 1944, yesterday evening, Universal Time. Some quakes there on the California coast. That, that 6.5 came in at 5.36 Universal Time this morning. Turkey's still shaking. And let's get back to space. First, take a moment to press like and subscribe. We are frankly surprised that you found the channel, considering what's been going on on YouTube the past three years. So thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, press like, subscribe, share, etc. We, we may do a live stream later today. Uh, there may be a panel discussion about another YouTube channel. And uh, we may even do a cosmology segment. Maybe we'll throw it all together into one video. I'm not sure on that. If you want to support the content, consider becoming a member of the Smash Team at smashamash.com slash smash team. We've already explained the likely mechanism that underlies the solar sunspot cycles. So if you want to read about that, it'll only cost you 10 bucks. I mean, you could become a gold member for one month and read all the gold Smash Team level posts. It'll open them all up to you. Of course, there's also a silver level, which doesn't get to read about the mechanism we believe underlies the solar sunspot cycles. And of course, we are composing a paper on that. So if you'd like to help us out with that, become a silver member, gold member, even a bronze level helps out. We do send out email alerts also for natural disasters. We decided not to send one about the Papua New Guinea quake because we figured there would not be a tsunami at a quake nearly 600 kilometers depth. Anyway, we do send out email alerts. Make sure you click the post page. You'll see our latest videos and so on. We do send out email alerts for our video releases as people do not trust organizations like YouTube to notify them when we put up a video. So here we are back in space. Back in space where the planet, where the channel belongs. So yeah, welcome to space. This is the last 24 hours. SDO 335 plus 171 angstroms. And again, the likelihood of major solar flares here is rising. Now, we did forecast a coronal mass ejection to arrive at some point today. Not seeing that yet. Perhaps it missed. Perhaps it was mixed in with the coronal whole high-speed stream. Uh, there were some uh, disparities in forecasts of that, and there always are with coronal mass ejection forecasts. Let's go through some stats here before we talk a little bit more in depth in, about that. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux currently at 161 solar flux units. There's the graph of the one-year performance. That's the black line is the radio flux. Looking like a new support level forming here around 150 solar flux units. The red line below it is the sunspot number. And here's your space weather enthusiast dashboard. No forecast for geomagnetic storms or geomagnetic unrest, according to NOAA. Now, if we get to the end of the day today and we haven't seen another significant coronal mass ejection impact, well, then we would have missed out on the forecast. However, keep in mind, folks, it is in everybody's best interest to over forecast. Now, of course, our channel has never said anything about a KP8 being scary in any way. KP7, not scary. KP8, also not scary. As you know, we try to tell people facts like first world nations power grids are largely protected against induction induced destruction as the transformers will shut off due to electronics that, that will shut them off before in other words your power will your power might go out but it's unlikely that your power system will get destroyed because of billions of dollars of upgrades in the past 6 or 7 years to the US power grid anyway that's the space weather enthusiast dashboard and uh, as you can see here there are no sort of forecasts for any CME impacts at least by NOAA so we are getting out of the meaty part of the range here. Oh, it looks like there is something going on there. 
Looks like a minor CME is maybe earthly directed there. Not exactly sure on that one. We'll have to take a look at the coronagraphs in a moment. So first, the KP index, which is a measurement of global geomagnetism, by the way. Currently at 2.67, it's a geomagnetically calm condition. Next, the last four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space. Smooth sailing at the moment. It's just nominal conditions there. Nothing remarkable happening at the moment. That's our geospace magnetosphere movie for the past four hours. Here are the past four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from the ground. And we show both of these segments daily on the daily space weather because the data is not accessible in archival form. So we at least show four hours. Again, things are quite calm here at the moment, although we do have a significantly elevated solar wind continuing from a coronal hole high speed stream. We'll get to it by looking at the data from Lagrangian point one. So there are a series of spacecraft that orbit this gravitational equilibrium point, Lagrangian point one. It's about a million miles toward the sun in between Earth and sun. You've got the the SOHO, the ACE, and the DISCOVER all located there that we regularly look at their information from. So here is the data at the moment from DISCOVER. So that's the latest signal there. You can see that blue line at the bottom. That is the DISCOVER by itself. Current conditions are, again, quite unremarkable here. Uh, about 8.4 protons per cubic centimeter for the solar wind density, solar wind speed here nearly 600 kilometers per second. So that is still highly elevated. I did hear some somebody stating yesterday on YouTube that the solar wind has diminished and it's it's still at like 600 kilometers per second. So that's still a highly elevated solar wind speed. Not where it was as it reached up to nearly 900 kilometers per second during the coronal mass ejection slash coronal hole wind stream assault that we saw a few days ago where we saw a KP7. So those are the current conditions, and let's take a look at magnetic data. There your goes magnetometers here, looking a little bit smoother and locked into a tight range here. So we're seeing kind of uh, lower highs and higher lows there on the goes magnetometers. And let's take a look at the heliospheric current sheet as it gives us great ability to forecast. So we can expect to see continued kind of small variations in the goes magnetometer for the next 24 hours based on what I see here. Uh, this is some data that... If you're not familiar with looking at it, it might it might not help you at all. However, if you watch our channel every day, you might understand how this works. Uh, this is showing the potential field surface source lines between Earth and the corona, also between stereo A and the corona and stereo B and the corona. And that gives us great forecasting value because it shows us the different magnetic hot spots and cold spots, essentially. It also shows us the polarity of the heliospheric current sheet in which Earth is now in a solidly South Pole-oriented current sheet. Let me redraw that S. That was a terrible S. So Earth is in a South Pole current sheet here, right in the middle of it, basically. The North Pole, the North Helio, the North uh, Solar Magnetic Pole here on the opposite side of the Sun, South Magnetic Pole facing right toward Earth. Here's our line of sight field plot, and you can see that B field all fanned out like that. That is the Solar Magnetic Equator effectively. And folks, don't get the geographic poles and the magnetic poles confused. They are completely different things, both on Earth and on the Sun, as evidenced in this imagery. So here's our line of sight coronal hole plot. And we've got lots of well-defined South Pole-oriented coronal holes here in the Earth-facing zone. We still do see South Pole magnetism at the South Heliographic Pole, another indication that we are still a long way from solar maximum. So to all the channels that have been telling you for the last two months that we are already at solar maximum, are you going to admit that you're wrong? I, I guess not, because on YouTube, nobody admits that they're wrong. They just attempt to gaslight you about the past and move the goalpost and create ridiculous straw man arguments to try to defame those who have been citing facts the entire time about solar activity. If you are an utter hack, just get out of the space weather game or maybe take a class from Millersville. Maybe watch Tamitha Scove's channel and have a clue what you're talking about. 
Next, the last 24 hours and 211 angstroms, that is SDO, and that is a very well-defined coronal hole. We can expect a significant high-speed wind stream from that one. That'll show up in about four days, maybe four to five days, and that will certainly produce a signal for an extended period of time. For those of you who are new to the channel, coronal holes are radio jet features. So out of that coronal hole, there are protons blasting out at a high rate of speed. And coronal holes are known to be the producer of high-speed coronal hole wind streams. So in about four days, you can expect to see a huge uptick in the solar wind density. And then the solar wind density will drop off, followed by an increase in the solar wind speed. That's the signature of a coronal hole high-speed stream. And what's great about coronal holes is they show us the solar polar field reversal process perhaps the most important feature of the solar sunspot cycle. The next most important feature is sunspots, and we'll get to it here in a moment. First, if you haven't checked the links below the description, check the links below the description. You'll find the Red Bubble Shop, which may or may not reflect the apolitical views of the channel. Yeah, we're apolitical on the channel. I've never been associated with a political party and probably never will be because reasons. Today's featured product is Do the Math. Sagittarius A-star version. And of course, when I first graduated high school, I was actually a computer, sci a computer information science uh, with a focus on math as opposed to the business side of computer science as I'm more of a pure science nerd than I am uh, concerned about business. I'm concerned about advancing the science. So I had to get out of that field, though, because there's no way I was going to be copy-pasting code for 30 years. So that's why I became a pro bike racer. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's one of those things that you have to do at a certain time, right? So we knew there was plenty of time. I knew there was plenty of time to pursue cosmology at a future date. And I realized in the mid-90s that there was a hole in cosmology, a hole created not by black holes, but by a lack of understanding of heliophysics. So it was super obvious that the sun was not well understood back in 1994 or 95, I think it was. I think I took astronomy in second semester. And uh, yeah, it's understanding how the sun works equals understanding cosmology. And uh, we're not trying to discredit or defame anybody at the moment. Uh, but, <laughs> but in order to understand what's going on in distant stars, we have to understand what's going on in that star. So back to the sun here. Uh, yeah, so likelihood of major solar flares here rising as sunspot 3234, which has been the largest flare player in the past 24 hours, moves on. Uh, looks like we may have another sunspot down here as well. So this one will get it. Oh, it's already got a name, 3238. There we go. For some reason, I thought that one wasn't named yet. Anyway, that's the situation. As you can see, the likelihood of X-class flares here getting above 60% there at some points. Uh, and of course, if this sunspot was more symmetrical, it would probably be less likely to produce large flares. Anyway, here's the last 24 hours in SDO continuum wavelength. Continuum is actually a series of wavelengths. And also keep in mind, this area down here is quite magnetically complex. That could produce a large flare and a little bit of growth of this new sunspot over here. So that one will get a name today for sure. That's now looking like it's a beta gamma class sunspot group. This one here is, oh, I'm not sure. Well, that one's beta gamma class up there. That one down there is trying to decide whether it's beta or alpha class. So both of these groups as they set are certainly capable of producing large flares, especially this one. And as you can see, that leading umbra is over double the size of planet Earth. Let's move to energetic particles and solar flares. Energetic particles are flatlined here, having seen those ramp way down following a, a double whammy SEP event. That's an SEP event. We call that a solar energetic particle event. Not to be confused with cosmic ray flux. Shout out once again to Tamitha Scove for taking the bait and responding to my tweet. I wasn't coming at it from a place of ignorance. I was just hoping somebody in the realm of cosmology, space weather, etc., would respond. And there's your flare profile. The largest flare of the past 24 was this 
M8.6. That came in around 1750 universal time yesterday. And it was an impulsive flare, so it had a quick ramp up and a quick ramp down. Since then, a couple other small M-class flares have been. Let's look at just the past day. That was M-class, I think. Well, maybe only a C9.91, but almost an M-class flare, and that one was almost an X-class flare. And let's take a look at our flare wavelengths. 94 angstroms is part of the ultraviolet spectrum. The extreme ultraviolet spectrum. That is radiation that doesn't make it down to the planet. It's filtered out by the mesosphere layer. So we need spacecraft like the SDO to image it. There you can see that large, nearly X-class flare happening in the northwestern limb. Also some flaring happening in the southeastern limb. Here's 131 angstroms. And I'll bet you'd like some close-ups of those flares, wouldn't you? Well, I think we can accommodate you. So there's 131 angstroms. We'll let that play through a second time for your viewing pleasure. We've also got 94 angstroms in this same view. Give that a minute to initialize. There we go. And leave us a comment and let us know what you think the money shot is for the day. Let us know if it was reflected on our thumbnail as we make those after we produce the video. Here are both wavelengths together. This is 94 plus 131 angstroms. Again, likelihood of major flares here remains higher than 50%. It's an exciting time to be doing space weather and cosmology. So anyway, let's take a step back here and look at what's going on overhead. If you're up before dawn, you might see Saturn and Mercury being chased by the sun. And if you're looking at the early evening sky, you might see Venus and Jupiter very close together there. In the early evening hours there, just after the sun sets, you should be able to see Venus and Jupiter, the third and fifth brightest object in the sky at the moment. Mars is currently a little bit brighter than Jupiter, I believe. It's much closer to us in the solar system. So there you go. There's the view of the solar system there. Keep in mind it is not to scale. And we're going to show the one-week forecast. So this is where things are now. Here's where things will be in a week. And let's move on to look at coronagraphs. Coronagraphs are devices that obscure the solar chromosphere to only show the corona, really the outer corona, because this is actually the chromosphere, that circle right there. And this outer disk, that's sort of the that's sort of the, the line between the the uh, the inner and outer corona. And of course, we use coronagraphs to view coronal mass ejections. It adds contrast because, well, stars are bright. That's what the obscuration disk is for. That's yesterday's images. And there were some minor CMEs there, nothing really major. Here are 41 more frames from today. A couple more minor CMEs happening there, and those do not appear to be earthly directed. Let's just take a look at some more imagery here from Stereo A, located right there. And we use, the we use the Where is Stereo Today page to show where it is because it's, well, it's nowhere near Lagrangian 0.5 these days. So there's Stereo A plus the Soho Lasco C3. Let's bring this back. Keep in mind these are not synced, but they are 90 frames each. So we'll let these both play through here. There we go. Pay attention to the time and date stamps at the bottom.
And thanks for the kind words, Mike. Mike says, shout out to whoever is in second place in daily space weather. FYI, we can't even see you with a telescope. That is high praise, and thanks, Mike. May you reach some high air today if you decide to perform a 900 on your skis. So here is the last 24 hours. That's our great composite imagery there. SDO 304 angstroms plus the Soho Lasco C2 and C3. We'll get a little closer. Because reasons. Did you know smells like teen spirit deodorant is still a thing? Who knew? Who knew? I mean, it became a little bit popular back in the early 90s, right? Yeah, it's still a thing. By Menon. Just thought I'd share. I don't know how we started talking about that yesterday, but. Yeah, so there's some more solar fireworks for you. Uh, and by the way, consumer tip. The sun's not going to kill you. Terrible decisions made by humans might kill you, but the sun, mm, not so much. Maybe if you're an astronaut. Maybe if you're an astronaut or if you're taking transpolar flights three times a week. All right, so here is our ground-based solar observatory. We're going to look at filaments as we have a massive number of filaments on the Earth-facing portion of the closest star. All those dark absorption features, also some prominences. Looks like the Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris filaments are still intact. This one over here should get a name. I mean, this one here is very substantial. It's a prominence. Who knows how long it might be, but well, that's a separate one too. So there's a prominence there and this one rising ahead of the prominence. Those, those ought to get names in my opinion. Which brings me to Twitter, an account that hardly anybody sees because of pathetic, putrid, and disgusting shadow bans on all big tech sites. Really probably on alt tech sites also, but certainly on big tech sites like the junkware fraud site known as Twitter, which became deathware about three years ago in 2020. Anyway, you're still invited to name that filament. The one that sent two CMEs headed toward Earth, that was named Tamitha Scove. What a great name. I mean, that was just luck, basically. I just picked one that looked awesome and decided to name it Tamitha Scove. Somebody who knows a lot more about space weather than your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash o -Mash. Anyway, if you'd like some free samples for free mushroom gummies, check it out. There's a link pinned to the Twitter feed. So you don't have to be logged in to see that. That is publicly visible as our Twitter is not private. Uh, if you don't have a Twitter account, create one, but you can still find the link there to the Hemp Lucid free gummies giveaway. And let's take a look at the filament fest that's going on here in SDO wavelengths. There you go. Nine, uh, 304 plus 193 angstroms is great at showing the extended corona solar filaments like the Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris down here. And yeah, this filament here certainly needs a name. This one is looking quite large and very well defined. Also some filaments up here. Not sure if they're named or not. Anyway, it's I can't keep track of them. It's a little bit too much stuff to, to memorize. So that's the last 24 hours of composite imagery from SDO. We'll also show the last 24 hours in 171 angstroms. This filament over here is looking like it's getting a little bit unstable, wouldn't you say? I mean, there's the here's here's the past couple of hours actually. Let's move forward to the Go 16 SUVI. Oh, there's what you'll see if you click the <laughs> the, the free mushroom gummies giveaway. All right, let's close that out. Here's a Go 16 SUVI. That's the past about two and a half hours. What is up with that? Let's press play again here. Did that filament already eject? Nope, looks like it's still there. So anyway, this brings us to our bonus feature segment. <laughs> Starting out with satellite charging hazards. So we've got some significant charging hazards happening here. Check it out. We've got some internal charging here caused by high energy electrons getting inside of satellite circuitry. 
So they're not major as they're not shown in red. However, they could get major as we are seeing an electron storm. Now, it's not super high yet, but it is expected to continue to increase in the coming days. So at the moment, some surface charging here in the Central Pacific and some internal charging all across the Indian Ocean, Western Pacific, and moving into the Central Atlantic. There is your GOES electron flux as measured by the GOES-16 and GOES-18 from their geosynchronous near equatorial orbits. They use radiography to measure the electron flux at the F layer of the ionosphere, which we'll also show you here in a moment. First, the forecast by NOAA, and you can see where NOAA is still expecting very high levels here. They've lowered that expectation a little bit. It was a little bit higher if you watch yesterday's video. YouTube.com slash smashomash slash videos is the URL to find our content if you're <laughs> unable to see it because YouTube doesn't recommend it to you. Because, well, I, I mean, I guess it's because YouTube likes to promote propaganda, fraud, and nonsense and likes to suppress facts, which has certainly been the pattern to see over the past three years. Big tech, it's not just junkware anymore. Now it's deathware. Anyway, there's your relativistic electron flux over the past year. Again, those are measured at the F layer of the ionosphere. So let's take a look at that. Feel free to pause the video on this frame if you're not familiar with thermospheric temperatures. The penetration of electromagnetic radiation and thermospheric molecular concentrations. Here's the vibrational frequency and the anomaly gram of the F ionosphere layer. Now we showed massive low frequency anomalies yesterday. I guess certain channels who think they can forecast earthquakes weren't paying attention as they've in the past claimed that the ionosphere could be used to forecast earthquakes and perhaps they're employing sheep's bladders to prevent earthquakes also not exactly sure on that but this is the vibrational frequency of the f layer of the ionosphere the bridge between earth and space and of course where we see low frequency anomalies we would expect to see sort of higher density air there and uh, anyway let's just leave it at that and continue to show the imagery here. We like to tell channels who have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to physics, how their own theories play out with the data that they're able to clearly view on the internet. So this is provided by the Australian Government Bureau of Meteorology. And, you know, I'm looking at the South Atlantic anomaly right now, which is which may be splitting in two. So I'm not totally sure on that. Well, yeah, it looks like it's still over the South American continent. So we documented about a month ago on the channel uh, that the South Atlantic anomaly moved from here down to here and then up to here. And we are still seeing some, some uh, indication that the South Atlantic anomaly may be, may be split so keep in mind, if the South Atlantic anomaly moves toward, toward the equator, that's an indication that the magnetic excursion is ending. And if you're wondering if I think Earth's magnetic fields are going to reverse, I absolutely do not think Earth's magnetic fields are going to reverse for a second. Certainly not during your lifetime. Anyway, let's bring up the latest image here before we move on and cite even more facts. There's the latest image Ionogram, that's 1300 universal time, and there's 1300 universal time anomalygram. We'll also show the total electron content forecast, another thing claimed to be able to forecast earthquakes at a fairly high, uh, allegedly a fairly high level of accuracy, although about four days out. So anyway, the total electron content shows you the free electrons between your GPS satellite and your handset. And things are pretty orderly here at the moment. So your GPS satellite has to communicate through the inner portion of the outer Van Allen belt, the outer plasma sphere, the inner Van Allen belt, the inner plasma sphere, and the ionosphere. And those free electrons can cause signal refraction. At the moment, again, pretty normal here. So we've seen some very, very anomalous total electron content forecasts in the past couple of months at the moment. Things pretty normal, except for some nighttime GPS errors, although they still are concentrated around the equator. If your GPS is not performing well, try turning on Wi-Fi location accuracy, as the known locations of the IP addresses of Wi-Fi hotspots can help you navigate. 
Next, the latest solar intensity gram and magnetogram. So first of all, let's check out this new spot forming down here. And that is indeed a beta gamma class sunspot group. It does have a leading south pole umbra and a trailing north pole umbra. That makes it beta gamma class. This group up here, wow, beta gamma delta class all day. So that's a quite a magnetically complex group, and you can see different field polarities there getting very close to each other, like back here, also in, in this area right in the middle, also at the front. So that is very likely to produce possibly an X-class flare, maybe even multiple X-class flares. Again, there are lots of filaments on the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk as well, so it's continuing to be an exciting time for space weather. Let's take a look at these new groups up. Well, let's take a look at this one first. So that is, at the moment, that's only alpha class, as I only see one umbra there. And even this trailing umbra, that is also North Pole magnetism. So at the moment, it is a beta class sunspot. Last but not least, this group up here, actually, that's probably two sunspot groups. So this, this second one might get a name as well. So that one there, that's a separate group. This farther north one, let's see, that is alpha class. And this group down here, I think that one's alpha class too. It looks like only North Pole magnetism there. So at the moment, it's a little bit early to tell, but that will be named a new sunspot as well. So a couple changes to the sunspot number and so on. Again, likelihood of solar flare is very high, and it's about time to get to meteorology. First, again, take a moment to visit the links below the video. Our new and perhaps best affiliate ever our affiliate slash sponsor, Hemp Lucid, will afford you discounts if you enter the promo code SMASHOMASH, the promo code SMASHOMASH on checkout, or just use the link below the video in the description to shop. Great products there of all different types. So check it out. The viewers are loving the Hemp Lucid discounts. Support the channel via clicks if you're unable and or unwilling to open your cobweb-encrusted wallets and send us a few bucks per month by becoming a member of the Smash Team. The best value, by the way, is the annual gold paid-up subscription as it affords you complimentary merch. And if you join at the gold level, you can also have a, an at smashomash.com email address. Most first names are still not taken. So if you want an email address like, I don't know, dan at smashomash.com, I haven't taken it. So <laughs> check it out. Become a gold member. We will hook you up. Smashomash.com, the official homepage of the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. And welcome to the Neo Renaissance. So we're looking at wave height as I am a wave chaser. Yes, I am fixated by waves when I am at the beach. I am. I have a surfing brain. Anyway. Largest waves in the world right now are about 33 feet there in the North Atlantic. And uh, yeah, those, those are the largest waves in the world. At least they were when we did show prep. Those waves by Iceland and Greenland, not as big. Even, in, even the waves in the Southern Ocean, not measuring up. So the North Atlantic right now, the most turbulent waters in the world. Anyway, as we move into the realm of meteorology, let's take a look at the surface winds on this side of the planet. There you go. There is the eastern world, and shout out to our viewers from Munda. What we really need is more viewers in this area right here, where there are at least two to three billion people. We wonder if they're able to see the content. These are the jet streams of the eastern world. Jet streams of the Western world. Cold air being injected deep into the southwestern U.S. Surface winds of the Western world looking like this. Strong winds there on the California coast. And also two low pressures there in the northern 
Atlantic. Here are the surface winds of the central world, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And these are the jets. The 250 hectopascal winds. And let's blast through the rest of meteorology. As it's getting late. So here's the water vapor map. This is the water vapor satellite, part of the NASA GOES Interactive Weather Satellite Suite. The water vapor satellite for the Americas. That should give you a little bit of insight as to what's going on on the upper level. And the moisture of the atmosphere is super important, especially if you understand things like this is a high pressure zone with respect to the air around it. So even though this isn't technically a low right here, it is a much lower pressure than this dry mass of air to its south. Maybe that helps with your atmospheric physics. I don't know. But let's continue on here to look at our weather.gov map. So we still got huge warnings here. There's some flooding expected in Arkansas, Missouri, Mississippi, Tennessee, Alabama, and Oklahoma. Also Hawaii. So we'll scroll down to show you the key. If your location is lit, head to weather.gov and click on your spot. Click on your location as those are too many counties for us to cover the weather alerts for. We only zoom in so far. Weather.gov. So here are some forecasts. This is your GFS 72 hour accumulated positive snow depth change in inches and more snow coming to the Lehigh Valley. We're excited. Even though it will curtail the bike riding. So that's okay. Hopefully you've got an indoor trainer as Pennsylvania is going to be once again inundated. And if you're going on vacation, if you'd like to go on a cycling vacation, why not head to the Lehigh Valley? Come ride with the Lehigh Wheelman Association. You could even ride with me theoretically, depending on which rides you do. Come to the Lehigh Valley, rent a bike. One of the most prominent cycling communities in the world and some of the best cycling roads in the world. Heavy snow and other precipitation there being pumped into the Pacific and in, pumped into California from the Pacific. Here is your pressure and precipitation forecast based on the same model. This is the GFS 72 hour model and yowzers. It's going to be a major ice storm here. Check it out. Dag. Pennsylvania is going to get plastered with ice here. Look at that. That is substantial, especially the central southern part of the state. Places like State College and the high point of Pennsylvania, Mount Davis, are going to get hammered as that low moves from Arkansas and then reforms into a second low there. Yowzers. Some heavy, heavy snow there around the Great Lakes as well. Again, that's your 72-hour GFS pressure and precipitation forecast. And here is the Euro model. So that's the next three days of new snow on the Euro model. There's the GFS model. Again, there's the Euro model. Quite different for Pennsylvania there. So the Euro model predicting a lot less snow for Pennsylvania than the GFS. Euro model also predicting a lot more snow for Missouri, for example. So again, there's the Euro model for the next three days of new snow. There's the GFS model for the next three days of new snow. And let's take a look at lightning as we did see a minor thunder shower there over Texas, kind of east of Abilene. That's the past about 10 hours. And here is the close up from lightningmaps.org. Little thunder shower there striking Dallas. Hey, Dallas, the Cowboys suck. Hey, Dallas, there's thunder rolling in. Dallas-Fort Worth, seeing a little bit of early morning lightning. So there's a location of those strikes. Next time you hear thunder, check out lightningmaps.org, powered by blitzotong.org. And here come the last three frames of the video. It's our U.S. Doppler radar map as we zoom from space to the lower 48. So there's the full 50-state view. U.S. Doppler radar. Clouds and fog at 3.9 nanometers. Infrared radiation is what that is. And there is the water vapor map. Hopefully.
hopefully that'll clear things up. Here's a recap to close out today's daily space weather video. We saw a niche because we realized that nobody was covering what we wanted covered. So rather than complain about it, as that's very ineffective on YouTube anyway, we just decided to make substantive videos about it. So there's the water vapor. That's where we'll close things out. Once again, thanks for tuning in to the Smash News Network, least busted name and news. I've been your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash o -Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind be at your back. <laughs>